My name is Victoria Farrow, and today we're going to cook with summer's vegetable abundance. Summer's a great season for plant-based eating. In fact, sometimes the choices and quantities are almost more than a person can handle. We'll look at a variety of delicious and healthy dishes to make with summer vegetables. Full recipes for all the dishes discussed are provided at the end of this video. As always, good meals start with careful selection. Whether that means harvesting at the right time from your own garden, or purchasing the best produce at a farmer's market or supermarket. It's always great to purchase locally grown produce because it's usually much fresher, and it's more likely to have been harvested when it's ripe. When selecting produce, I always look for plump green stems and smooth skin. It's also important to know how to best store your fresh vegetables. This is a list detailing which vegetables should be immediately refrigerated, which should ripen on the counter, and which should remain at room temperature. I've included this chart at the end of the presentation so you can review it with the recipes. But remember, it's important to use good judgment. If your tomatoes were spoiled before you can use them, by all means put them in the refrigerator. And any time a vegetable is cut open, the remainder needs to be refrigerated. It's natural for stores and farmers markets to display onions close to potatoes. They both grow in the ground and are such great companions in cooking. But be sure that when you bring them home, you store them in different places. Onions will promote the sprouting of your potatoes. Let's talk about washing produce. If you bring vegetables in from the garden, you may feel you should wash them immediately. But in washing them, you're removing some natural protection, and the resulting moisture promotes the growth of bacteria. It's best to just brush off any soil, and then wash the vegetables later, when you plan to use them. Leafy greens are the exception. They stay crisper if they're washed before refrigerating. Wash produce under running water with no detergent or bleach. Wash produce even if you plan to remove its skin or rind, so you avoid contaminating cutting boards and surfaces. You do not have to wash purchased, ready-to-use bagged produce. Sometimes you don't need to do much more than wash and cut up vegetables for a wonderful meal. As a country, we've gotten away from turning what is ripening at the moment into a meal. My mother tells of her grandmother serving new potatoes and peas at the entire meal when both were freshly harvested. Often you can turn the day's freshly picked vegetables into a wonderful salad plate. When the vegetables are in season and very fresh, there's really no need for a dip or dressing. The vegetables all on their own are delicious. If you do want a dip for vegetables, hummus is a nutritious alternative. The great thing about hummus is that you can also spread it on a tortilla and then cover it with whatever vegetables you have on hand, chopped, sliced, or shredded. It works great with almost all vegetables. This recipe is included in my Meatless Mediterranean cooking presentation, but it's so perfect for raw summer vegetables that I'm going to repeat it here. It involves very few ingredients. Chickpeas, olive oil, sesame tahini, lemon juice, garlic, and salt. Canned chickpeas, also called garbanzo beans, work fine for the recipe, but when I'm able, I like to cook dried beans to avoid the additional sodium. If I'm using dried beans, I wash them and cook them in a pressure cooker. They need to cook until they're very soft. I cook them at least 45 minutes in my pressure cooker. I want our hummus to be smooth and creamy. Drain the cooked chickpeas, but save the liquid. The next step is optional, but completing it makes an extraordinarily smooth hummus. The step is skinning the beans. My husband thinks it's crazy to even mention doing this, but it's actually quite easy to skin them with your fingers in a bowl of water. The bean pops right out. Many of the skins will float to the top so you can pour them off. Next, process the beans with olive oil, bean cooking liquid if you have it, or water, and salt. 
Add tahini, lemon juice, and garlic. Tahini is a thick paste made from raw sesame seeds. You may have to stir your tahini before adding it to integrate the oil that rises to the top. Tahini may be available in international sections of your grocery store, and it's almost always available in health food stores. I mince the garlic before adding, and I add it gradually during the processing and taste it after each addition. Garlic can overwhelm hummus if you're not careful. Puree again until very smooth. It may seem a little thin, but it will thicken as it's refrigerated. We make hummus often in the summer to eat it with any fresh vegetables available. It's a great totally plant-based dip with very little saturated fat. Hummus is also a great base for tortilla wraps featuring fresh vegetables. I just cut up the freshest vegetables, spread a tortilla with hummus, and add the vegetables. Leftover hummus works great for quick, fix-it-yourself meals. Here a plate of various vegetables have been prepared for covering hummus on a tortilla. For this very informal lunch, we've put the refrigerator dishes right on the table. An occasional concession to my husband who takes care of dishwashing for meals. Also included is a cucumber salad we'll make in a few minutes. A cream cheese spread with raw vegetables makes another very easy summer snack. I don't usually use mixes of any kind, but a little ranch dressing mix is a great way to easily add considerable flavor to the cream cheese. You could also just add some minced garlic or onions or herbs if you want to avoid the mix. I finely chop vegetables or food process them and assemble everything on a cutting board. Spread the cream cheese mixture over a tortilla. Sprinkle the vegetables on top. Notice that I've left about one inch on one edge with no vegetables. The area without vegetables will seal the roll shut when you roll it. Roll it up and then place the rolls in a container and refrigerate them if possible for at least an hour for easier slicing. Slice the roll into pinwheels. The pinwheels stick together more firmly if you use more cream cheese as I did in the four rolls in the center but I really like them with less cream cheese and more vegetables as around the outside. This is a great snack for children as well as adults. It's even fun to make with children. If you want, you can also mix the chopped vegetables into the cream cheese and then spread it, but I like the way it looks with the layer of cream cheese and the contrasting vegetables. Another recipe using raw vegetables is Asian zucchini noodle salad. At some point in the summer, most of us find ourselves with more zucchini than we know what to do with. This is a great way to use the vegetable. This salad can be made with finely sliced zucchini, but if you have a spiralizer or other food slicer that will make zucchini noodles, they're great for this recipe. My spiralizer works best with half a zucchini at a time. I don't peel the zucchini as the peel is fine to eat, it adds color to the dish, and most importantly of all, it contains many of the vegetable's nutrients. Actually, a zucchini is a fruit, but for this presentation, we'll refer to it as a vegetable. When I'm spiralizing the zucchini, I set a baking pan under the machine to catch the noodles. The zucchini noodles will come out very long. I use kitchen shears to cut them into smaller strands. These noodles are very low in calories and can be used with a variety of salad dressings and pasta sauces. If I'm using them as pasta, I don't boil them as you would noodles. If I cook them at all, I drop them into boiling water and immediately remove them and drain them. Often I just add hot sauce and the heat will cook them just enough. For this recipe, we don't heat them at all. We just add a dressing of soy sauce, rice vinegar, sesame oil, and sugar. I always try to use low or reduced sodium soy sauce. We all need to avoid sodium whenever we can. I like to use dark sesame oil for this recipe. It has a stronger flavor than regular. This is a delicious salad. It's also good with shredded cooked chicken added for an entree. Quick cucumber salad is another easy vegetable side. 
We eat this often in the summer. It's an easy way to keep up with the sometimes overwhelming cucumber production in your garden. Young garden cucumbers or hothouse or English cucumbers from the grocery work best for this salad. English cucumbers are the very long cucumbers wrapped in plastic in the grocery. They have very few seeds. Thinly slice the cucumbers. You can do that by hand with a knife, or you can use the slicing side of a box grater. If you're using cucumbers with large seeds, you might want to remove some of the seeds before slicing them. I have sometimes used a mandolin to slice the cucumbers, but recently have begun using this simple slicer, which acts like a mandolin, but doesn't involve adjusting sharp cutting blades, which seems safer to me to use. It also is much easier to clean. The container base that collects slices is also very helpful. Also thinly slice a red onion. Combine the sugar and water in a pan and heat until the sugar has dissolved, and then add white vinegar, salt, and red pepper flakes. You don't need to use a fancy vinegar for this. Plain white distilled vinegar works just fine. Pour the hot liquid mix over the cucumbers and onions and refrigerate the mixture. It's best if it sits overnight in the refrigerator, but I must admit that we have often eaten it hours later. We've even eaten it warm. It's delicious and keeps very well. We grew crystal apple cucumbers this year, a cucumber that's about the size of a tennis ball and has a lot of seeds even when young. The seeds are not as tough as they are in many large cucumbers, so I tried making this salad with seeds and all, and it actually came out fine. As you can see, not only did I have the wrong kind of cucumber, but I also had only yellow onions. The salad doesn't look as attractive as it might, but the flavor was great. It can really be made with any onion. The onion doesn't have to be sweet. This salad is a great dish to have on hand to eat with other leftovers. Here we're enjoying it with sliced tomatoes, roasted beets, and raw peppers. It's a tangy, sweet, and sour. My husband calls it dessert. We're featuring a lot of raw salads, but it's hard not to when we're dealing with the great fresh vegetables of summer. Cilantro lime slaw is a great coleslaw variation, one that goes really well with seafood and with tacos. It's very simple to make. Shredded cabbage can be purchased, but it's also easy to shred your own. I use the slicer we used earlier for cucumbers. If you use a slicer like this or a mandolin, be sure to always use the knobbed spike vegetable holder so your hands never come anywhere near the blade. You'll end up with some exterior leaves that don't shred. I just shred them using my chef's knife on a cutting board. Thinly slice a red onion. I also add shredded carrots or thinly sliced peppers. Chop fresh cilantro. Cilantro is very tender. It's fine if some stems are included with the leaves. Mix the dressing of olive oil, lime juice, honey, garlic, red pepper flakes, and salt. Fresh lime juice is great for this, but you can also use bottle juice if you don't have fresh limes on hand. Combine the vegetables, add the dressing, and toss. Here we're adding it to a shrimp taco. We love it with tacos. Another recipe that takes advantage of seasonal vegetables is summer squash and sweet corn. It's a cooked side, but it's also great warm, at room temperature, or even cold. This dish is very simple, and that means every ingredient is important. The recipe works with any summer squash. Just be sure your squash is fresh. The squash on the upper left would make me decide to cook something else. We want to leave the skin on to maximize nutrition, so freshness is especially important. I cut the squash in a small dice just a little larger than corn kernels. If you prefer, you could shred the squash. If you're using fresh sweet corn, you'll need to husk it. It's easy to pull the husk and silk off, but sometimes the process frustrates people. 
You can use your microwave to make it easier. Just put the ear in the microwave with the husk on. Microwave for two minutes and then remove it, being careful to use a thick towel or pot holder to protect your hands. It will be hot. Cut the bottom end off and then squeeze the ear out. The silk will stay in the husk. It works really well, but I have to admit that I still do it the old-fashioned way. It was one of my jobs as a child. However you husk your corn, the next step is to remove kernels from the ears of corn. It works great to set a small bowl upside down inside a larger bowl. Cut a piece off the bottom of the ear to make it flat and stand the ear of corn on the small bowl and just cut down the ear to remove the kernels, which will fall into the larger bowl. This is a safe and neat way to cut the kernels off. Next, chop onions or scallions. If I'm using yellow squash, I like to use scallions so their green tops will add color to the dish, but onion will also work. If I'm chopping scallions, I cut them in thirds, gang them up, and slice off the pieces. Then I chop them further. Saute the onions or scallions, and then add the squash, and saute until the squash is almost done. You want it tender, but not overcooked. Add the sweet corn and saute for a minute or two longer. If you've used the microwave to husk the corn, be sure to saute only long enough to heat it through as it will already be cooked. Here is the dish made with zucchini, which is my favorite squash to use for this recipe. This is a great dish because the primary flavor is of sweet corn. So it's a nice way to use zucchini without it seeming like yet another zucchini dish. When you eat what feels like a half cup of corn, you're really eating a quarter cup of corn and a quarter cup of zucchini, which is much lower in calories. This dish is great warm, at room temperature, or cold. In the summer, it's especially important to be flexible with cooking. When these string beans began maturing a few at a time, I steamed what I had on hand, chopped them up, and added them to a batch of corn and zucchini. I also chopped up one of the stalks on an onion I'd just harvested and used that for the onion in the dish. The dish worked great with these changes. My only disappointment was that my purple string beans turned dark green when I cooked them. I'd hoped to add purple to the dish. Summer often brings a surplus of greens and herbs. A delicious way to use those is to make a pesto. The traditional pesto is made with basil, and it's delicious. Basil leaves are food processed with garlic, olive oil, pine nuts or other nuts, lemon juice, and salt, and then cheese is often added just before it's served. If you want your pesto to stay bright green, you can blanch the basil by dropping it into boiling water draining it, and then shocking it in ice water. Squeeze the excess water out and then puree it. You can also just make it with the raw basil leaves. I have to admit that's what I usually do. As the season progresses, I find that sometimes basil becomes very strong. I've discovered that adding a small amount of cooked potato when I'm processing the pesto dilutes the strong basil just a little and also results in a creamier pesto with no added cream or oil. Pesto freezes well. I freeze it in muffin tins and then put the frozen cakes in a freezer bag so I can pull one out whenever I want pesto. Chefs have started making pestos out of all sorts of green plant material, and you can experiment too. This spring I made a pasta sauce out of pureed kale and made one using basil and garlic scapes, that part of the garlic plant that you remove when garlic is developing. Both were delicious. I also made pesto for the first time out of fresh carrot tops. I love making use of vegetable parts I might normally discard. You just strip the fine leaves from the carrot top stalks. Puree them in a food processor. I added the pureed tops to salad dressings and also added garlic and olive oil to make a pesto sauce for pasta. 
At one point, I added roasted carrots to the carrot top pesto, along with some chopped toasted walnuts. The dish was very tasty. Summer is a time to feel free to try adding vegetables you have on hand, even when you're using a recipe. I make this next recipe every year when tomatoes are getting into full swing and the first potatoes are being harvested. Mediterranean Potato Salad It's a great summer salad because it doesn't have any mayonnaise so it keeps well on a picnic table and really lets the fresh flavor of tomatoes and potatoes shine through. If possible, I clean up the potatoes and leave the skins on. For that reason, I always try to buy organically grown potatoes. Many pesticides are used by commercial growers and washing potatoes doesn't remove them all. I cut the potatoes into pieces and steam them. Next, I slice onion, chop green olives, and measure out capers, adding them all to the potatoes. If I can, I use very ripe heirloom tomatoes. You really need ripe tomatoes for this recipe. You can have small tomatoes, but I like big juicy chunks in this salad. I try whenever possible to not refrigerate my tomatoes. When you keep tomatoes on the counter, it's best to set them stem side down, and I cover them with a kitchen cloth to discourage gnats. Core your fresh tomatoes, cut them into wedges, and then into chunks. Remember that if you cut a tomato open and use only part of it, you will need to refrigerate the rest. And you'll need to refrigerate the salad if you're not eating it right away. Combine everything with the dressing of olive oil and white wine vinegar. Season with salt and pepper and you have a delicious salad. This is a very easy recipe for enjoying newly dug potatoes, or any other firm potato for that matter. It's potato with mustard dressing. According to Joe Robinson, author of Eating on the Wild Side, a potato's skin contains 50% of the antioxidant activity in the potato, and its high fiber slows the digestion of starch and sugar, giving the potato a lower glycemic value. So the skins are important for maximum nutrition. So I always try to leave the skins on. But as you can see, I do clean them up, trimming off any green areas, eyes, and highly blemished areas. These potatoes were pretty large, so I've cut them into chunks. Next, heat olive oil and Creole mustard, which is a very coarsely ground mustard. Any coarsely ground mustard will work. Sometimes it's called country mustard in the grocery store. I also add a little cayenne at this point. You can adjust the amount for your taste. You can use butter instead of olive oil, but I feel olive oil works well, and I always prefer to use an unsaturated fat whenever possible. Add the potatoes and stir. Sprinkle chopped parsley over the potatoes. Stir in and the dish is ready. It's great warm, but we often eat it at room temperature as well. If you plan to eat it at room temperature, I would definitely suggest you use olive oil rather than butter. Roasting is a great way to cook excess vegetables you have on hand in the summer. Roasting brings out the natural sugars in vegetables and really enhances their flavor. As the week progresses and I'm left with bits and pieces of vegetables not needed in dishes I've made, I will often just combine them on a baking sheet with olive oil and a sprinkle of kosher salt and pepper and roast them. If some vegetables are done earlier, I just remove them from the sheet and then return the rest to the oven. Just about any vegetable roasts well. I love the fine roots on the carrots. They become crispy. We like the vegetables highly caramelized, but you don't have to brown them this much. You can roast the vegetables on a higher rack in the oven and just until they're cooked through like this. I like to put ours on the bottom rack for at least some of the time so they brown at least slightly. Roasted vegetables can make a meal or serve as a side. Our next recipe is a very easy pasta recipe that we really enjoy. Green pea, basil, and scallion pasta. 
The recipe can be made with fresh peas, but frozen peas also work very well. I think these days peas are a highly underrated vegetable. They really are delicious. Because of the shape of peas, this recipe really works well with a pasta shape that has a pocket to capture some of the peas. First, chop scallions, or green onions, and fresh basil. Basil really works well with peas. To finally chop the basil, I pile the leaves in a stack and then roll them into a cigar shape. I finally slice through the roll and then chop more finely. Next, cook fresh peas or drop frozen peas into boiling water just long enough to thaw them. Assemble the ingredients at the stove because cooking will take very little time. You want everything at your fingertips. Chefs call that mise en place, everything in place. We make the sauce by sautéing the scallions in two tablespoons of melted butter and one quarter cup of dry vermouth. This is one recipe where I do use butter rather than olive oil for flavor, but it would also work fine to use olive oil if you prefer. Vermouth adds a nice flavor, but if you don't have it, you could use a dry white wine or even a vegetable broth. When the scallions are softened and the vermouth has thickened some, add the peas and basil and cook for a few minutes. I try to time my pasta so it's ready about the same time as the sauce. I also sometimes make the sauce to the point where the peas and basil are added and turn it off. When my pasta is done, I reheat the sauce, add the peas and basil for the final cooking. Here I'm using medium shells. When I drain my pasta, I save at least some of the cooking liquid. Pasta water is a great way to thin a sauce slightly without making it watery. The starch in the water acts as a subtle thickener. This sauce can become dry. A little bit of pasta water will make it perfect. I always add a tablespoon or so of pasta water to leftover pasta before putting it in the refrigerator to keep it from becoming dry. Pasta absorbs additional liquid as it sits. Our next recipe features ripe tomatoes. It's a tart with a thin base of custard, cheese, and herbs, and circles of thick tomato wedges. This is a tart to make when vine-ripened tomatoes are plentiful. First, prepare tomatoes by coring them, cutting them into wedges, and then letting them drain in a colander to remove some of the liquid. The recipe uses both basil pesto and chopped fresh basil, along with oregano. Here I'm using some pesto I froze earlier in muffin tins. This is made in a pie crust that has been baked blind, baked without filling. You can make your own favorite pie crust recipe, or you can purchase a crust. You can use a 9-inch crust and just roll it out to 11 inches to fill a 10-inch tart pan with a removable bottom. Pesto is spread over the bottom of the cooled, baked crust. The Swiss cheese is sprinkled over it. You could substitute cheddar or mozzarella for the Swiss cheese, or use a combination of cheeses. Next, sprinkle with the mixture of chopped fresh basil and oregano. The tomato wedges are then laid on top. A custard of eggs, salt and pepper, and a small amount of heavy cream are whisked together and then poured over the tomatoes. You can swirl the pan to distribute the mixture between the tomato wedges. Bake until all is set. This recipe is all about the delicious baked fresh tomatoes. Our next recipe is for an entree, eggplant stuffed red peppers. With a tossed salad, this makes a full meal. Eggplants and peppers star in this dish. In the summer, it includes vine-ripened tomatoes. You can see here, though, that I'm making it in the winter when Roma tomatoes are the very best tomatoes available. Globe eggplants like the one pictured work well, but really any eggplant will work. Dice the eggplant into one half inch to three quarter inch pieces. Note we're leaving the skin on. 
The only time you would need to peel the eggplant would be if it was not fresh. The skin can get tough as it's in storage. The eggplant doesn't need to be salted for this dish either. Cut the red pepper in half and remove the core, membrane, and seeds. Place the halves cut side up on a baking sheet. Chop the other ingredients including anchovy fillets, capers, Kalamata olives, parsley. Measure out dried breadcrumbs. If I'm using romas, I usually peel them for this recipe. I don't usually peel vine-ripened heirlooms harvested in the summer unless they have a very tough skin or large amount of seeds. To peel them, drop them into boiling water for a few seconds and then into an ice bath. The skin should pull right off. If you want, you can cut an X in the skin at the bottom of the tomato before putting it in boiling water to help the skins peel in large pieces. I usually don't find that necessary. I usually also seed romas. I just cut them in half crosswise and squeeze out the seeds. Then I chop them. I don't usually seed summer tomatoes, but you can if you want. Saute the eggplant until tender and add other ingredients except the breadcrumbs and simmer. Remove from the heat and add the breadcrumbs. If you're looking for a gluten-free entree, it could be made without the breadcrumbs. If I did that, though, I would definitely seed the tomatoes to eliminate excess moisture. Divide the filling among pepper halves, drizzle olive oil over them, and add one cup of water to the baking pan. Bake at 450 degrees and serve warm or at room temperature. I love room temperature entrees and sides. They reduce so much of the last minute pressure of meal making. We're going to cook another summer vegetable entree that's perfect for when peppers and tomatoes are ripening. It's a spicy Moroccan vegetable stew. Spicy vegetable tagine. It's called a tagine because it's traditionally cooked in a special vented baking dish called a tagine. We'll cook ours in a casserole dish, but if you have a tagine, by all means use it. And any earthenware baking dish will work especially well. The dish features peppers, celery, tomatoes, and potatoes. Fingerlings are delicious in the dish, but they're not required. I many times use small potatoes, but large ones work as well. I also sometimes use small tomatoes I've popped in the freezer when I was afraid they were going to spoil, like those shown in the bag. In this dish, celery is used as a major vegetable. The recipe calls for 24 2-inch pieces, which is probably more celery than you've ever put in one recipe, but be sure to use it. I trim out the sections like those shown on the right, but otherwise use pieces of all thicknesses. Next, cut one and a half inch squares of red, yellow, and green peppers. You can use any color, but it's great to use one green and two of the sweeter peppers, red, orange, or yellow. I cut slabs from the pepper, remove the membrane, and chop the slabs into squares. If you use small tomatoes, just slice them in half. You can also chop larger tomatoes. If using fingerlings, you need to only slice them in half lengthwise, which makes them fairly thin throughout for cooking. Here I'm using a larger Yukon Gold potato. Normally, I wouldn't peel my potatoes for this recipe, but when I see green chlorophyll like this on a potato, I know that it's been exposed to quite a bit of light, which also encourages the production of solanine, which can be toxic to humans in large amounts. A potato like this is likely to have some concentration of solanine in the same area. As a safety precaution, I always peel a potato like this until there's no visible green and remove eyes and their green. I don't want to take even a remote chance of making someone ill with my food. Next, combine the celery, peppers, and tomatoes. 
You can see here that this time I made the recipe using wedges of larger tomatoes as well as some smaller tomatoes from the freezer. It's a very flexible recipe. This dish includes an herb sauce that can be hand chopped or more finely chopped in a food processor. Whether I'm using a food processor or not, I peel the garlic and use a garlic press to mince it. Here I've pressed down on the garlic with a knife to crack the peel, peeled it, and minced it in the press. Next I chop parsley and cilantro. Note I've chopped an entire bunch of parsley and have enclosed what I don't need in a foil package and labeled it for freezing in a freezer dish or bag. I try to immediately do that with any fresh herbs I'm afraid I won't be able to use. They keep beautifully in the freezer. Next, I combine the garlic, paprika, cumin, cayenne, and salt, and then add the parsley, cilantro, lemon juice, apple cider vinegar, and olive oil. I prefer to hand chop the herbs so there are larger pieces. But you can also process it all for more of a sauce. Either method results in a very flavorful dish. The next step is very important. You steam the potatoes until they're almost done. If you don't do this, you will need to seriously overcook the peppers and other ingredients in the oven in order to have edible potatoes. I know this because I recently forgot the step. I've also begun throwing the celery in on top of the potatoes for the last four or five minutes or so, especially if the celery is very firm. Usually that means very green. Combine the pre-cooked vegetables and everything else in a large baking dish. Cover it with a lid or foil. Bake covered. If you have hand chopped herbs, it will look like the photo on the left and the right is the way it will look if you process the herbs in a food processor. You can serve this stew with couscous or rice. I like to serve it with Moroccan couscous, which are easy to make. They include toasted sliced almonds and chickpeas. You can toast the almonds in a skillet on the stove or in an oven. Just watch them closely as they're very thin and will burn easily. Juice a lemon. I have given a measurement in tablespoons as the size of lemons and the amount of juice in them varies widely. Remember that lemons with a little give will be juicier, and they'll juice better if they are at room temperature and if you bear down and roll them on the counter a few times before cutting them in half to juice them. Combine drained and rinsed chickpeas with couscous. I always use low sodium beans if possible. Add hot broth or water and the lemon juice. Cover and let it sit. The couscous will absorb all the liquid. This pasta involves no additional cooking. Your meal will be ready. This dish reheats well too. If you're like us, you enjoy having leftovers for future meals. If you have leftover Moroccan couscous after the tagine is gone, you can easily make it into a great salad. Just add chopped fresh vegetables, herbs, lemon juice, and olive oil. I also add a little bit of water whenever I'm making a salad out of leftover pasta. Carrot orzo is a great side to make when carrots are in season and fresh rosemary is available. Orzo is a small, rice-like pasta. This dish resembles a creamy risotto, but it's much easier to make. I really like to use sweet, young carrots for this, but it can be made with eddy. You could grate them, but I chop them very finely in a food processor. You then saute the carrots and uncooked orzo in two tablespoons of butter until the pasta is golden. Add the water, broth, and minced garlic and cook until the liquid is absorbed, stirring frequently. Remove from the heat and quickly stir in the Parmesan cheese, sliced scallions, and minced fresh rosemary. It's creamy with delightful flavors. Watermelon rind pickles are a great way to turn kitchen waste into delicious food.
This is a recipe I've adapted from one my grandmother used. In reality, I think it was originally my great-grandmother's recipe. Remove the fruit from each watermelon slice. I used to meticulously trim off all the red, but I've come to realize that it's actually quite attractive to have a little left on. Next, trim off the green skin. Be sure to do this safely. You can lay the piece on its side and cut against the board to trim off the skin, but it's probably easiest to use a vegetable peeler. Hold one end of the rind in a hand and peel the other half, then switch ends. The rind will be a bit more tender the farther you get away from the peel. Cut the rinds into chunks and let the pieces sit overnight in salted water. Boil in vinegar and water until they're soft and then cool them. Boil sugar, water, vinegar, turmeric, cinnamon, cloves, and allspice until it becomes a syrup. Add garlic powder and onion powder if you like, I do, and then add the rind and mix. These could be kept refrigerated or you can process them using instructions for your canning equipment. I usually make just a small batch and use them over a few months. If you would like to make any of these dishes, full recipes follow. Remember, you can pause the video at any point to photograph a page of the handout or review a recipe more closely. If you want to view the video for a specific recipe, the description below the video contains a list of contents with a link to the recipe in the video. Page 1 includes recipes for summer squash and sweet corn, spicy vegetable tagine, and almond and chickpea couscous. Page 2 features recipes for cucumber salad, eggplant stuffed red peppers, and crunchy vegetable pinwheels. Page 3 includes recipes for Asian-style zucchini salad, cilantro lime slaw, Mediterranean potato salad, and basil pesto. Page 4 features recipes for watermelon rind pickles, potatoes with mustard dressing, and fresh tomato tart. On page 5 are recipes for hummus, carrot orzo, and green pea, basil, and scallion pasta, as well as information on roasting vegetables. This is the chart we looked at earlier, showing how to best store various fresh vegetables. Thank you for watching this presentation. We hope you've found some new ways to work with summer's vegetable abundance. If you enjoyed this video, you might want to subscribe to my channel for future videos.